My name It's a scam. Oh, sorry. I, I kind of got ahead of myself there. Uh, uh, do continue. My name is Morris. And I'm dry. And this is the Morris Zero. It's a dryer. From the future. Shut up and take my money. It might just be the fastest, jetless dryer on Earth. Holy camoles, look, it's got design awards. It got a red dot award. That sounds amazing. And, and look, look, a red dot honorable mention. The innovative quality of this energy efficient tumble dryer is emphasized by its uh, appealingly unconventional overall image. Red Dot Jury, and it's been featured on all of these people in the press, like Grabby News, That's True, Product Hunt, and Deals Wire. It's small wonder that this amazing ultra-fast dryer has pulled in almost half a million dollars in about a week. Which is good, because I've got to be somewhere in 20 minutes, and this just happened. That's amazing! I think I'm seeing the massive market for this already. It's for all those times that I was at home, but I had no other clean, dry clothes that I could change into, but I happen to spill water, and only water, on my t-shirt, then I can use this miracle dryer to dry my t-shirt in the instance that I didn't have another t-shirt to change into in the next shot. Thankfully, the Mora Zero uses vacuum technology. No, not that vacuum. Space vacuum. Oh my god, space vacuum in my tumble dryer. That's that's amazing. It's even got its own trademark of vacuum plus technology. Because just like in outer space, the water inside Morse evaporates at a lower temperature, thus requiring less heat and energy to vaporize. Uh, no. No, 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 no. This whole sales pitch is based on fundamentally flawed science. A vacuum here will not help you in the slightest. In fact, far from being the greenest way of drying your clothes, this might be the most energy intensive, wasteful, and unenvironmentally friendly way of drying your clothes, short of say, tying your clothesline to a Dodge Ram fueled by endangered whale oil, getting hammered on Jack Daniels, and driving around the rainforest in sloth crossing season. Allow me to explain. You see, this is a glass of water, and the reason it's not going anywhere is because the water is evaporating very slowly. And the reason it evaporates so slowly is clear when you look at the surface of the water at a microscopic level. Super. So what you've got here is a computer simulation of a really, really small bit of the air that you're breathing. And inside the air, there's a little drop of water. So most of the air that you're breathing is made up of nitrogen, those are the blue guys, and oxygen, which are the red guys. And there's a few water molecules sat around here. Uh, and that's the vapor pressure of water. That's, that's essentially the humidity. And the reason there's water in there is because there's a little droplet of water in in the middle here. And the thing you'll notice immediately about the water is it's really pretty strongly held together compared to the gas. The gas molecules here, by the way, are actually moving at about the speed of sound. And uh, the, the surface of the liquid's much more agitated. I, I did another video about it. You have on you think that's air you're breathing. Anyway, so I'm going to pause that just for a second. And the reason I'm going to pause it is to actually show you what it is that holds the surface of the water together. So I've just changed the representation of the, the molecules for a second. And the reason I've done that is so I can show you what it is that's actually holding all of this together. So there are chemical bonds between the oxygen and the hydrogen. Those are really strong. Those essentially never break. But what gives water so many of its remarkable properties are these really quite strong interactions between the, the hydrogens of one molecule and the oxygen of another. And these are called hydrogen bonds. And you'll find that the whole liquid is just completely held together by these things to the point where you get these great chains of these guys that form up like so. And those hydrogen bonds are actually pretty strong. A simple analogy would be a little ball of magnets. You, you want to pull a magnet off the surface, you got to put in enough energy to break that magnetic attraction between the magnets. There are no shortcuts here. It's a thermodynamic 
inevitability. You want to dance with the devil, you have to pay the thermodynamic demon its due. It makes no difference if there's vacuum there or not. The energy you have to put in to break the hydrogen bonds is the same. I mean, seriously, this is actually a pretty accurate molecular dynamic simulation of a drop of water in air. The density of the molecules in the liquid and in the gas are basically spot on. Now, this is just the interesting thing about air, is when you look at it like this, the space between the gas molecules, that's vacuum. So, as bizarre as it might sound, from the perspective of the water droplet, the air surrounding it is actually 99.9% .9 vacuum. The practical physical upshot that we observe in reality is the vapor pressure of water. That is, if we were to get some water and put it in a sealed container, the number of water molecules per unit volume in the space above the liquid, the, the vapor pressure is 999 parts out of a thousand not dependent on the atmospheric pressure. So all atmospheric pressure is, is how many of those molecules are actually hitting your skin per unit area. And it basically scales with the number of molecules there are in the air. So about 80% of the molecules in the air are nitrogen. So about 80% of the pressure on your skin is from the nitrogen. And when you've got saturated vapor pressure of water at room temperature, it constitutes about 2% of the molecules in the air. So about 2% of the atmospheric pressure pushing on your skin is due to water vapor. Now, I typically use the very intuitive units of one atmosphere, which is a fairly self-explanatory unit. And bar is essentially the same thing. If we put a drop of water into a sealed flask, the vapor pressure of water at room temperature is about 1 50th of an atmosphere, 1 50th of a bar, 20 millibars. And what's the vapor pressure of water in that exact same flask if I evacuate all of the air first? About 20 millibar. Vacuum does not change the vapor pressure of the water. So how does atmospheric pressure affect boiling. I mean, it clearly does. It's in almost all of the textbooks that by the time you get up to the top of Mount Everest, water boils at about 70 degrees Celsius. And kids at school, if you want a question to torment your teachers with, because almost everyone gets this question wrong, they'll almost always come out with some answer about, well, clearly when the atmosphere is not pushing as hard and stopping the water molecules from evaporating, then it'll boil more easily. But you can see with a Mark I eyeball the absurdity of this proposal. The air has almost no effect on the ability of the water to evaporate. Hell, students at university, if you want to stump a professor, my personal experience is about nine out of 10 get this wrong. So why does atmospheric pressure affect the boiling point? Well, it's almost entirely a red herring because boiling is a kinetic phenomena, not a thermodynamic one. Now that might sound complicated, uh, but it's really not so bad. So let's take a little example to make this all clear. Let's just say we've got some water in a container and there's gonna be a nucleation center in that water, a little bubble. On the inside of that bubble, there is only the vapor pressure of water. That's 20 millibars at room temperature. And of course, on top of that, we're gonna have one bar of atmosphere pushing. But to, to make it less confusing, I'm gonna replace that with a piston. And that piston is gonna be pushing with one bar of pressure on the top, 1,000 millibars. So obviously, the bubble is just gonna get squeezed closed because of the external pressure that is applied. But of course, if I removed almost all of that pressure, you know, which would be in reality done by sucking out almost all of the air, I'm going to reduce the pressure on that piston such that it's 1 50th of an atmosphere, 1 50th of a bar. 20 millibars is now the pressure pushing on that piston. And of course, my little bubble here, there's 20 millibars pressure of water on the inside. So the bubble will neither grow nor close. Although, of course, that bubble oh, would probably rise to the surface given a chance. But let's reduce the pressure to 19 millibar on the piston. 
Now, of course, the vapor pressure on the inside of that bubble is higher than the pressure on the piston. And the practical upshot is the bubbles will continue to grow. And that is the process of boiling. But you will notice here that the process of boiling has no effect whatsoever on the vapor pressure of the water. The vapor pressure of the water is 20 millibars, whether you're in a vacuum or in air because vapor pressure is fundamentally only dependent on the temperature of the water. That's gonna be important, we're gonna come back to that. But what if I don't have a little bubble there to start with? Well, in that case, all you're gonna get is evaporation from the surface. You can have stable water above 100 degrees Celsius. And that's what I mean about it being a kinetic process. You need those nucleation centers to give you the little bubbles Otherwise, the water won't boil. And I should stress at this point, 20 millibars is not a lot of pressure. If you want to get power out of water vapor pressure, you know, like say for instance, a steam engine, you, you're not going to run many steam engines on 20 millibar. If you want to do something sensible, you need atmospheres of vapor pressure of water, which means being well over 100 degrees Celsius. In fact, decent steam engines would heat the steam up to about 200 degrees Celsius, at which point the vapor pressure of the steam is about 10 bar, 10 atmospheres. Cool, so where were we here? Oh yes, applying a vacuum is a very comparable way of drying to simply a dry stream of gas. In fact, it turns out the stream of dry gas will actually be more effective for drying than a vacuum. But why? Well, remember what's happening when you're evaporating. You want to get a water molecule to break all of those hydrogen bonds and escape into the, into the vapor. Now, you might think that that's partially going to happen by gas molecules hitting the surface. And to actually take a look at the simulation of gas molecules hitting the water surface, and you realize there is not a bad chance in hell of that causing evaporation. Evaporation depends almost exclusively on a subsurface fast water molecule, a fast angry water molecule, hitting a surface water molecule hard enough to break those hydrogen bonds. After this angry molecule has hit this surface molecule, it becomes a slow moving molecule. And seeing as the speed of the molecules is a pretty decent proxy for the temperature, this represents cooling for the liquid. Evaporative cooling is what we see on the macroscopic scale. The problem is, of course, that as the solution cools, <laughs> There are less fast, angry water molecules, so the rate of evaporation decreases. Further, in vacuum, there is no sensible way of transferring energy into the liquid. So it basically freezes, and once it freezes, it stays frozen. I've got a very dramatic example of this with liquid ammonia, which doesn't freeze at zero degrees Celsius, but minus 70 degrees Celsius. This is colder than the coldest point on Earth. So if I pump liquid ammonia at merely at minus 30 into the vacuum chamber, it almost immediately freezes because of the evaporative cooling. And then it forms little ice crystals which just sit there at minus 70 degrees Celsius. So the little bit at the top is the microjet of ammonia and it just grows and freezes. And it sat there quite happy at minus 70 degrees Celsius in a, a, in a vacuum chamber at room temperature until it just warms up a little bit on the base and then it just jumps into the cold trap. And in this other remarkable demo, what we've got is the liquid ammonia is coming out of the little nozzle and it's freezing almost instantly. And the reason it's freezing that quickly is because of the evaporative cooling. And it's the evaporative cooling that's keeping it not merely at freezing point, that's at minus 70 degrees Celsius. And you can see when that little ammonia ice touches some of the hot metal, it sort of dances around because it's instantly boiling some of the ammonia on the surface. But you can see just how much this evaporative cooling can slow down the process of trying to evaporate either ammonia or water. Now I should say that ammonia and water are actually similar materials in many ways in that they're both strongly held together by hydrogen bonds 
and they've both got very high latent heat of evaporation. Or if you don't like those sorts of demonstrations, you can do some pretty simple thermodynamic calculations, which will tell you that if I have a cup of water, or if that if I have some water in a cup or in my clothes, it doesn't really matter which, if I evaporate about 20% of that water, that water will have lost enough energy to turn into a block of ice. Or if you don't like the calculations, this one I can actually just simply show you. So what I've got here is a little bent piece of glass tubing that's sealed under a total vacuum. So the only thing that's on the inside of this tube is vapor pressure of water. And in one side, I've got a little bit of water. And in the other side, I've got nothing. But that other side, I'm going to immerse in a cold bath. And so what you're going to get is water is going to evaporate from one side and it's going to cool down with the evaporative cooling and it's going to go and condense over the other side. Let's see how much water you actually have to evaporate to turn the rest into a block of ice. Okay. Oh, an instant boiling on this side. Now, oh, and I can see it icing up already. Jeez, this is fast. Yeah, I can actually. And in fact, it is. It's ice already on the top. That's unbelievable. That's unbelievable. And I think that's the rest of it. Is that the rest of it freezing? It is. It's, it's frozen. I can see it freezing. I can hear it cracking. That's unbelievable. And it's quite impressive on the thermal camera as well. Get that into the uh, cold bath. Okay. Oh, an instant boiling on this side. Now, oh, and I can see it icing up already. Jeez, this is fast. Yeah, I can actually. And in fact, it is. It's ice already on the top. That's unbelievable. That's unbelievable. And I think that's the rest of it. Is that the rest of it freezing? It is. It's, it's frozen. I can see it freezing. I can hear it cracking. That's unbelievable. That's amazing. Is it solid? No, it's it's frozen on the top. That's amazing. And just to show you how much I've I've actually distilled some minuscule amount of water over in all of this. So if I now leave it all to thaw out you'll see just how little water had to transfer from this side to this side to turn that into a block of ice. And it should be almost nothing. Amazing demonstration. This is just block of ice. Okay, and... We're now melting on this side, and there is. There's about a drop of water in there on that side. Let's see if we can zoom in on that. And you should. Just a tiny amount of water has actually, no, it's more than that. It's, eh, it's maybe a milliliter. But that's enough to turn the other side into ice. So you need a way of transferring velocity, transferring energy to the water. Well, if you have a gas flow and that's in contact with the cold liquid, then of course that's going to supply it with some heat and that's going to maintain the rate of evaporation. However, in a vacuum, essentially in a vacuum flask, it's actually pretty hard to get energy into the water there. Ironically, putting it in a vacuum actually makes it harder to get energy into the freezing water. Now, in this case, they say they're going to supply the energy via an infrared lamp. Combined with its infrared heating system, it can dry your clothes in as little as 15 minutes. 
The world needs this. Not that I can see one in there, of course, uh, but whatever. They, that's what they say they're going to do. And that's going to supply the energy to evaporate the water. Cool. So we know exactly how much energy that has to produce because it's the energy to evaporate all the water molecules. Now, this claims it's going to dry all of your clothes in about 15 minutes. That's five shirts in about 15 minutes. That would require taking off about three quarters of a kilogram of water. I'm just going to call that a kilo for the moment to make the math simpler. And if you're generous later, you can reduce those numbers by 25%. So to evaporate a kilo of water will take you about 2 million joules. So to supply that in 15 minutes, that means that the power this thing would have to supply just to evaporate the water is about 2,000 watts. What is power rating? About half of that, 900 watts. Yeah, that's not going to happen. And, and that's, of course, assuming that's the only thing you've got to do is put the energy in to evaporate the water. And running the pump and condensing and getting rid of the water costs you nothing. A reality ain't that kind. Which brings us on to the second reason this is a dumb idea. You see, first of all, you've got to put all the energy in to turn it from liquid to gas. Then you've got to get rid of it to turn it back into liquid again. What you would normally do, heat your clothes to maintain the vapor pressure of water. Yeah, to stop your clothes from freezing. Then you put in a cooling circuit that takes the energy out and condenses the water. So is this some remarkable new discovery? No, these have been around for ages. They're called heat pump dryers, and they're some of the most efficient dryers on the market. They're basically a combination of a fridge and a dryer. And what you do is, of course, the fridge produces heat as it's working, and you use that to heat the air, and then it produces some cooling, which you use to condense the water. However, these boys don't have enough room for a, a mini fridge in here. And from their prototype, it's doubtful that they've even got enough room in there for a Peltier effect type dehumidifier. But that's almost the only thing they've got room in here for. So let's just assume they've gone for one of those. Now, normally I would be generous and say they can reuse the heat from the Peltier effect dehumidifier to actually heat the air apart. And they don't say that's what they do. They say they get their energy from an infrared lamp. Combined with its infrared heating system. So let's see what's available in the way of commercial dehumidifiers. Remember, this thing is going to be capable of condensing about one kilo of water in 15 minutes. That's four kilos per hour. So take your pick. I mean, this one's got good reviews, and it says it's what? Going to take off nine ounces of moisture a day. It's about a quarter of a litre, and it's going to run at about 20 watts to do that. So we need to pull off about one kilo in 15 minutes. Four kilos per hour. A hundred kilos per day. You would need about 100 of these dehumidifiers to get that rate of condensation. And they would slurp up another 2,000 watts of power. Yeah, none of this smells right until you look at some of the details in what they're promising. Now, this isn't going to dry a full load in 15 minutes, but maybe dry a single item of clothing in 15 minutes. Don't believe me? They have a demo. This is actually from their Kickstarter, where they dry a single shirt. This is just one shirt in their, in their dryer. Yeah, you can see that the dryer is almost full with just one shirt. Meaning that what they've got in most of their video stuff must be some of the smallest items of clothing ever. And after 15 minutes, they find that their dryer has pulled off a remarkable 200 grams of water. 200 grams! That's enough to dry one item of clothing. You want to try two items of clothing? 30 minutes. Four items? An hour or so. I mean, if you go through the frequently asked questions, you'll find the average amount of water this thing's going to pull off per use is 200 grams. That's enough to dry one item of clothing. I mean, maybe a more honest approach for their ad would be, have you ever wanted to dry your laundry or one item at a time? Now you can with the Morris one by one. Why save all of that precious time by putting all of your laundry in the dryer at once when you can put the items in one by one? 
this technological breakthrough brought to you by this amazing team of people. So it's not pulling off a kilo of water in 15 minutes, which I should mention is about the rate that a conventional full-size dryer pulls water off at. But it's going to pull off about 200 grams of water in 15 minutes. So it's running at one-fifth the speed of a full-size dryer. The reality is their statement about reinventing the dryer is maybe correct. Yet they've not done anything new. They've just made another dryer. The vacuum thing is a gimmick. The whole green thing is bull too. This is from the IEA report on dryers. Regular dryers have an energy efficiency of 0.6 to 0.9 kilowatt hours per kilogram of water removed. Heat pump dryers run at about half of that at about 0.3 to 0.4 kilowatt hours per kilogram of water removed. So what about our boys here? Well, they make a big deal of how efficient and green their dryer is. So there you have it. A future where drying is faster, greener, and safer than ever before. Greener saves up to 40% of energy consumption. Wow, look, a, a little asterisk. I wonder what that's comparing it to. Air drying maybe, which requires zero extra energy input. I don't think so. No, they're comparing it to dryers running at about 0.4 kilowatt hours per pound. That's about 0.8 kilowatt hours per kilogram. Whereas the remarkable Morris Zero runs at about 0.5 kilowatt hours per kilogram. Significantly less efficient than a regular heat pump dryer. Or let's do our own calculations, shall we? They say that this thing is running at about 900 watts. So to run it for an hour, it's going to take 0.9 kilowatt hours of energy. And during that, it's going to pull off about 200 grams in 15 minutes. Remember, that's where their demo video had this thing benchmarked at. So to pull off one kilo will take about 75 minutes. That means it's consuming about 1.2 kilowatt hours of energy to pull off a kilogram of water, making this one of the least energy efficient dryers on the market. Again, let's take a, let's fix their ad, shall we? Hi, I'm Morris. I've invented a brand new way of drying clothes called a tumble dryer, except my dryer dries items one at a time. It takes over four times the energy to run as the most efficient dryers on the market. Buy yours and start using all that extra energy today. The world needs this. But how can it be? This thing has a Red Dot Design Award. Well, an honorable mention. Look at all the glowing things they wrote about it. Well, let's take a little closer look at that award site, shall we? And Red Dot Awards, you'll find just in product design alone, there are 3,000 results. In fact, let's just try something here, shall we? Let's do a search for dryer. And what you find is there are loads of things just in dryer alone. And if we take any one of these, let's let's see what wonderful things they have to say. Statement by the jury. The perfect care collection is characterized by a visually appealing design, which in terms of ergonomic criteria is well thought through. That's super. Let's take another one and see what they say. Thanks to the innovative technology, this elegant dryer offers an impressive balance between performance and energy consumption. I think you get the point that this is all complete fluff. Thanks to the harmonious design language. What? Uh, this effective tumble dryer directs the eye to its ergonomic design, ergonomically designed controls. Yeah, I mean, this is all just machine generated flattery fluff. So this is where they got their design award. And it's not even a design award. It's just an honorable mention. Which brings us on to all these other remarkable websites that covered this great advance in drier technology, like uh, Grabby News, which, as far as I can tell, doesn't even exist at all, right? So do the spelling here. Grab e news okay let's see what that comes up with there's just nothing 
Actually, I kind of partially take that back. Turns out it's Grabien news. And if we do a search for this, we find this guy who is absolutely covered with commercials. Um, yeah, that, that's the great article covering them. Um, that's it. That's the entire article. With zero comments. I'm stunned. And a load of these other sites are verbatim just sort of spamming of the same news article. So this is the one on Acrofan, never heard of it. Or uh, what's what's this one on? This one is on Sisian. Okay, so the start of the article is exactly the same and you scroll down and you come to, uh, down to About Morris and it's exactly the same article. And that's how these promotional companies work. So if you actually come back to the Morris Zero and you come down to the bottom, you will find that they have some... I mean, this this is common now, that you basically get people to hype your product, which is basically they go around and they, they get you all these design awards and get people to write articles about you, which is basically they spam things up on blogs and such like. So this is promoted by Jellup um, and whatever, Launch Light and a load of these others. So let's take a look at this one. And what you'll find... Is they basically uh, focus on no, 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 no. Uh, they they focus on just pimping out stuff. That that's basically all they are. They're PR companies that allow things like this to get the best part of half a million dollars, all based on a gimmick dryer, all founded on something that is fundamentally wrong because just like in outer space the water inside morse evaporates at a lower temperature thus requiring less heat and energy to vaporize so this little beastie here is my infrared camera which i'm going to point over there for a second and you will see what you get on the screen here that's actually an image of the shirt up there and the nice thing is the thermal camera is you can get any pixel you want, you get a temperature off it, which is quite nice, but also very expensive. A cheaper version is this guy, who essentially fulfills the role of one pixel on that. So it's the infrared thermometer, and each, it, wherever you put the red dot, yeah, get a temperature. So it says that's what, 25 degrees? versus uh, 24 and a half there. Or if I come off to the, the side up here, it's about, oh, a degree or so cooler. So if we come up here, it's about half a degree cooler. So these are actually pretty decent. Um, and they clock in at about, oh, $20 or so. So I'll leave some Amazon affiliate links below if you're interested in that sort of thing. But the real reason I wanted to show you this is the speed of the evaporative cooling can be phenomenal. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a spray. This is just some water. So you will see that the water is about ooh, room temperature. It's all about 23-ish degrees. Now I'm just going to get a bit of a spray on my shirt, like that. And you will see that the temperature drops degrees very quickly. And if I put a fan on that, it'll get even better. So let's give it a bit, a bit of a blow with a fan. That should do it. And now look at the temperature, what we're down to uh, 17 degrees. Cool, so he's what, 18 degrees here. And if I take a zap with this boy, he comes in at 19 degrees. 
Cool. So if you want one of those or just want to visit my store to see what other scientific goodies I'd recommend, Amazon affiliate links are below. If you like this video, damn straight give it a thumbs up. Subscribe and hit the notification bell if you don't want to miss out on new content. And as ever, if you really like this channel and want to support it directly, you can do it through Patreon.